to worship with the Milton Seventh-day Baptist Church. If, if you want to access uh, song lyrics that we'll be using, or if you want to access the sermon notes for later, go to theconnecting.church to access those resources and other things. Again, that's theconnecting.church. Our call to worship today is from the book of Acts. And of course, Acts is about uh, how God was at work in dramatic ways during a time of crisis, uh, a time of disruption, a time of chaos. Sound familiar? The way that God was at work then undoubtedly is the way that God is at work among us today. In Acts chapter 27 and 28, there's a story about Paul and a shipwreck. And after the shipwreck, after it seemed like things couldn't get worse from that travesty, here's where the story picks up. Acts chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. What an uplifting call to worship. But, but think about this. There's chaos. There, there's ongoing crisis. And when it things like, seems like things are getting better, one more thing goes wrong. But the beauty about the book of Acts is that God is sovereign and continues to redeem situation after situation. Here, God brings about uh, healing. God brings about the gospel message being proclaimed. Similar to today. Now, let's be honest. We're in a shipwreck season. We're in a season of sadness, a, a season of crisis, but at the same time, a season where God is revealing his hand in dramatic ways. A season in which God is opening the door for gospel sharing. As we worship together, let's celebrate this sovereign God who opens the door for us to grieve a shipwreck season, but also know that he is with us, guiding us as we share his gospel hope. Let's sing Build Your Kingdom here. Come send your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray.
Father, we truly do ask that you set your rule and your reign individually in our own lives, corporately in our church family, in our community. Lord, may your name be praised. Father, we also lift up the fact that we're, we're in a shipwreck and we desperately need to know your nearness, to know your presence, to know your leading. May you give us an ongoing sense of your manifest presence with us. Give us confidence and humble boldness as we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call Father, you were pure I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near you throne Father, you love me You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace Early in the 
offerings, coming to our time of remembering through our tithes. And the story about Paul's shipwreck is pretty amazing because it's not all about Paul. After Paul's ministry on the island, before they're sent off again, I love what takes place. In verse 10, they, that being the people of the island, also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. The ministry wasn't just about Paul, wasn't just about a handful of people, it was about everybody together. That's one thing that we celebrate through our time of tithes and offerings, that we praise God together, we serve God together, and we encourage one another as we praise, as we worship, as we give our tithes and our offerings. We're going to sing, It Is Well, with my soul as the offertory.
Okay, good Sabbath. It's time for the children's message. This is what I've wanted to do for a really long time, but it was too messy to do at church. So we're going to do it here on my porch. What is going to spill out of my coffee cup if somebody bumps my elbow? Now the hint is right there in the question I asked. What's going to spill out of my coffee cup? Should we see? Oh yeah, it's coffee. Should we try it again? What's going to spill out of my coffee cup? Oh, it's not coffee. That was actually pink lemonade. It kind of depends what's in my coffee cup, doesn't it? Want to try a couple more? What's going to spill out of my coffee cup? Can you see? It's crayons. I had crayons in my coffee cup. I've got one more. This is my Walt Disney World coffee cup. What do you think is going to spill out of this one? Can you see? It's puzzle pieces. It's a horrible puzzle. Nobody should ever have to do that puzzle again. My reason for showing you these is because what spills out of our coffee cup depends on what's in our coffee cup. What comes out of our mouth depends on what's in our heart. So when something happens and my elbow gets bummed and my coffee spills, what spills out is coffee. If I have trouble in my life and I stumble, if what's in my heart is goodness and kindness, then good and kind words will come out. If what's in my heart is anger and frustration and impatience, words will come out that aren't so kind or so nice because what comes out depends on what's put in. Now we learn from the Bible something really special. In Psalm 119, it says, I have stored your word in my heart, so I will not sin against you. When we learn God's word and we store it in our heart, then when troubles come, good things come out of our mouth. There's a couple other passages I thought I'd share about that. In Matthew 15, Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and that can make a person dirty and unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts and immorality and theft and lies, and that's what makes a person dirty. And James in chapter 3 says, our words can be poison. With our words, we bless our Lord and Father, but with them we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth can come blessing and cursing. So Lord, we want what comes from our mouth to be blessing, to be good things. Just like what I want to come out of my coffee cup, I want coffee, not puzzle pieces or crayons or even lemonade. So Lord, let's pray, Lord. Lord, we want to have good, clean hearts so that what comes out of our mouths is blessings. Would you help us to store your word in our heart, to follow you closely so that we may bless you and be kind to those among us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Welcome to day 32 of our Safer at Home here in the great state of Wisconsin. And by now, the changes that have been made to our routines that have initially sparked irritations or frustrations perhaps have moved on to even greater conflict uh, in your home or in yourself. And so, as uh, Thomas Paine famously said, these are the times that try men's souls. And we certainly are in a time of difficulty and uh, perhaps it's for us first world problems, frustrations and challenges. Uh, there are certainly uh, challenges that people face around the world uh, that are greater and we want to keep those in perspective. But uh, now more than ever we need to be reminded of who we are as the people of God, as those whom the Lord has brought out of darkness and into spiritual light, as those whose identity is in Christ and not in the world. So let's not forget this truth that the joy of the Lord is our strength. 
While everything around us has contracted, has crashed, has been canceled, the Lord has remained the same as he ever was. His strength has not fallen like the stock market. His presence has not been isolated from his people. And his love has not failed to engage in this world each and every day. And so since the Lord is the same today as he has always been, the joy, the joy of the Lord is available to be our strength. But the joy of the Lord can't be our strength unless joy in the Lord is our reality. Now last week I told you that the greatest need we have as human beings is to know and to enjoy the Lord. With all of the changes that have been going on to our physical reality, now is the time potentially for the greatest step forward in our spiritual reality as believers in Jesus. If we have eyes to see the spiritual reality around us, we're not going to merely just endure this time of isolation and struggle. We will embrace this time as a gift from the Lord, which it is. I was thinking about the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, this past week. And there's one scene in uh, this movie that uh, stars Jimmy Stewart that's been kind of rolling around in my head. And uh, the movie takes place, part of the movie takes place during the Great Depression. And one of the scenes of the movie that uh, happened during the time when there was a run on the banks and the movie captures a run on the banks um, in, uh, in uh, uh, one particular scene. And so let me set the stage uh, for you for this scene. Now, Mr. Potter, the evil, grumpy old guy, the richest man in town, when the uh, banks start to uh, lose all their money and because people are trying to take it out and there's these runs on the bank, Mr. Potter steps in and he offers people 50 cents for every dollar that they have in their accounts because the bank doesn't have enough money, but Potter has money in his own accounts. And for most of the people in the town, 50% of what they have in their accounts is better than nothing at all. And so they go to the bank. Now, however, George Bailey, who is played by Jimmy Stewart, sees right through Mr. Potter's greediness and his willingness to take advantage of people in their time of great need. And he realizes that if all the people go and get their money from Mr. Potter, that he will own everything in town. And they will be at his mercy. So he pleads with the people at the savings and loan to not go to Potter. And one memorable line with all the people trying to get their money out of the savings and loan, uh, George Bailey says, don't you see, Potter's not selling He's buying if we all could just stick together. Now that scene has been running around in my mind this week. And the reason is, is because I believe now is a time for spiritual buying. Now is a time for great spiritual advance. When all the world around us is going through a run on the resources that they have in the natural world, now is the time for a great advance in the kingdom of God. We've heard a lot of reports about the spread of the virus and the impact that it's having on our economy and the world economy. Projections about when and how we're going to emerge from this crisis. These reports are coming from the natural world. But what about the reports from the spiritual world? Mr. Potter may have been buying for his greedy self-interest, but we who have spiritual eyes to see at this time and in this place, we must understand that the time is ripe for one of the greatest spiritual advances of our entire lives. The time is perfect to take a great step forward spiritually and to embrace the deep and personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is his, been his intention for us to have all along. Wherever you are at with the Lord, let me encourage you, you can always take a step forward. No matter how long you've known the Lord, no matter how far you've walked with him, you can always take a step forward in that relationship. And I want to encourage you that now is the time to take that step forward. 
So I have three questions for you this morning to answer, which will help determine if you are positioned for the great spiritual advance that God is doing at this time. Now, here's the first question. What do I believe? First question is, what do I believe? Now, to help us answer these questions, I'm going to be in the book of Titus. So I want to encourage you, grab your Bible, turn to Titus chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 14. Titus in uh, the uh, latter part of the New Testament, second chapter, looking at verses 11, uh, 14. So, uh, 11 through 14. Uh, so, to answer this first question, what do I believe? I'm going to read from Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Verse 11. It says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. A couple weeks ago on Easter Sabbath, I talked about how Jesus had to die on the cross, and I gave five reasons. Among many other reasons, his death was a gift to us because his sacrifice absorbed the wrath of God, because it showed the wealth of God's love for sinners, because it canceled the legal demands of God's law, which we as humans could not meet. It provided the basis for our justification just as if I, <clears throat> excuse me, just as if I'd never sinned. And number five, Jesus had to die because it brought us to God. And so this great gift of salvation brings about it, among many other things, these five uh, reasons, uh, five reasons why Jesus had to die to bring us the gift of salvation. But this gift cannot be received unless it is received with faith. Now Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 really highlights this. I want to read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and connect it with this concept that Titus is talking about, the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And so this gift of salvation, it is by the grace of God, which means it's not done by human ability, human effort, or, as I talked about last week, the works of the law. It can't be brought about, it can't be acquired, it can't be bought by human effort to obey God's law. Only 100% righteous people can stand before a 100% holy and righteous God. Now, human-centered Natural thinking, and we've been talking about in my series in 1 Corinthians on uh, the natural person and the spiritual person. The natural person's thinking believes that with a little bit of help, it's possible to be good enough for God. It's possible to be righteous enough to be right with God. But in the gospel of Christ, we are told that no human being will be justified before God by the works of the law. And I spoke about that last week. In other words, no human being can love God and love other people according to God's understanding of what it means to love. Not by themselves, not without God working in them. Because as I said last week, Jesus boiled down the entire law of God to two commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And human beings are unable, are, are spiritually unable to do that without the, the infusion of the love of God that comes through a relationship with him by faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, this is so ingrained in us, in the natural uh, this is so ingrained in our society that human beings have the ability to be good. We're good people. But it, the, the truth that Scripture uh, outlines for us is that every human attempt to be good in God's sight actually only moves us farther away from God and not closer to God. It's actually the opposite of what we think or what our default understanding is as natural people. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, uh, shows us this when it says that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. All of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. 
without Christ, without faith in Christ who gives us his own righteousness, we are unable to do anything that is even remotely close to being righteous and good in God's eyes. In fact, it's only like filthy rags, sinful actions. The things that we believe as natural people are good are in fact in God's eyes opposed to his law and opposed to his goodness. And so we need the righteousness of God, not our own righteousness, which, as you can see, amounts to less than nothing. The good news is that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is transferred to us when we put our faith and trust in him, when we believe in him. Now, that is the best news of all time. But this morning, I don't want us to move too quickly past what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus. I become convinced that there are many who believe that Jesus died and rose again three days later who do not actually believe in Jesus. You see, there's a diff- there are different types of belief, and only those with saving belief are the ones who receive the gift of salvation. Now, let me explain what I mean by this by using an illustration uh, from the life of the Lord. One day, there was a rich young man who came to Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you've been following along with me the past few weeks, when you heard what I just said, the young man asked Jesus, you might have had this reaction. The young man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If you've been following around with me, your reaction probably was, Well, you can't do anything to inherit eternal life. Only Jesus can do that. And that is the truth. That is the correct answer. But the Lord went about answering the young man a little differently than we might expect him to have answered him. He first asked him if he knew God's commandments. And the young man said that not only did he know the commandments, he had kept the commandments from the time that he was a boy. Now let's read into this response from the young man a little bit. The young man was in a place where he thought he was able to keep all of God's commandments with perhaps a little effort or maybe even a lot of effort. But we know that it's impossible for us as human beings, for any human being, to actually keep God's commands. It doesn't come about by human effort. And so the Lord responded to the young man with a question. Um, actually, with a, with, a, with a statement here, Mark chapter 10, verse 21, I want to read Jesus' response uh, for us. He said to him, uh, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, the ending of this story is all too predictable. The rich young man walked away very discouraged because he had many possessions which, of course, he did not want to give up. Now, what does this have to do with saving belief? The rich young man believed in God. He had to believe in God or else there would have been no reason for him to know and to obey or attempt to obey God's commands. But as the Lord said, he lacked one thing. When Jesus told him to to sell all that he had, he was really getting to and revealing What was the status of this young man's heart? In his heart, what the young man really believed was that his possessions were worth more than knowing God. If he had truly understood the supreme value and treasure that comes from knowing the Lord personally and understood the gift of salvation which the Lord was presenting to him, he would have left all that he owned behind in a heartbeat. And the same is true of us. Saving belief is the kind of thing that takes all that you are and all that you have. There are some things that you can believe in which make no difference at all in your life. But saving belief isn't like that at all. Saving belief changes everything. Saving belief makes a total and complete difference in your life. It's a kind of thing where you are either fully committed or you're not committed at all. It is the kind of thing where you are all in, where you don't have a plan B, where you're not hedging your bets, where you're not putting your eggs in more than one basket. Saving belief 
is all or nothing. Saving belief is where your life and your future are placed in the hands of Jesus, and there is no going back. Saving belief says this, I have decided to follow Jesus, and there is no turning back, absolutely no turning back. I have made my decision. This is my course. The grace of God has appeared so that everyone who believes in Jesus with this kind of saving faith can receive salvation, which is a gift, the gift of a personal and loving relationship with Christ Jesus. So in light of all of this, ask yourself this question. What do I believe? What do I believe? Second question. What do I want? What do I want? Titus chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 11 and t- verse 12 here. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly p- passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now the text tells us that not only does salvation come from the grace of God, sanctification also comes from the grace of God. Now, sanctification essentially means to make holy, or in other words, to change from ungodly living to godly living. This change in lifestyle, this change in a person's reality, requires training. Titus uh, 2 says the the, uh, grace of God uh, trains us to renounce ungodliness, to live godly lives in this present age, in our daily living. This change requires training, and that training starts with fundamentally understanding the nature of God's grace. So let's talk about grace. Grace means gift, and the gift that was given by God was not simply the taking away of the consequences of our sin. It was not simply forgiveness that's the gift of God. The gift is God himself. Sin steals this ability to have a close, loving, life-giving, joy-filled, satisfying relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Lord, by his grace, makes it possible for this kind of relationship to be realized, to be fully realized. And the the reason why it can be fully realized is because what God has done in our hearts through faith, the moment that we believe, God does something radical in our hearts. And Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 gets at one of the things, uh, uh, describing one of the things that God does when we believe, what he does with our hearts. Let me read Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10. He says, I will put my law into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so God's law being written in the hearts means that God puts the desire and the ability to do what is pleasing to him in us. That all happens because of saving faith in Jesus, and the Lord is the one who does it. And so the first thing God does when we believe is to give us his righteousness so that we can be with him and have a relationship with him. And the next thing that God does is to change our hearts to want what God wants. Now, since God is love, that that means that he makes it so that we love him and we love other people. And loving the way that God loves is the opposite of ungodliness and worldly passions. And so the training that goes on is that the Lord, who is love, comes into our hearts by faith in Christ, and he plants his love in us, and that uh, role of, of sanctification or growing in our faith, discipleship, is the process not just of understanding in our minds, but also believing and, and um, uh, living out and, and, and desiring in our hearts the things that are pleasing to God. And that is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love other people, love them as ourselves. And so this is a work that is the work of God. 
This is a work that comes by faith in Christ. And the reason why we have to go tra through training, and another word for that training is simply discipleship, is because even though Lord, the Lord writes his law in our heart, it takes time and the work of the Holy Spirit to get us to see the reality. And the reality is that God is so far greater than anything else in this world that we could ever want or desire. This is the reason why we need God's grace every day. Because sin lies to us on a daily basis. and tells us that the desires of our sinful nature are the best thing for us. But the grace of God opens our eyes and to see just how much more pleasing knowing God and being with him and enjoying his presence is than anything else that we have in this life. Now let me make a little sidebar on here. God has made this world uh, and everything in it for our enjoyment and our pleasure. There are lots of things to enjoy in this life that God has created expressly for our own enjoyment. But as we go through the training that comes from God's grace, and we get to see how wonderful God is, and we renounce ungodliness, as Titus tells us, we become more and more aware when the things that God meant for good for our lives become something that is a stumbling block to the best thing in our life, a relationship with Jesus. Sin is deceptive because it makes us think that the things God created are more important than God himself. But thank the Lord that his amazing grace doesn't stop working in our lives when we trust in him. And the moment that we believe, that's when he begins to work his amazing grace. And Philippians 1, 6 puts a real fine point on this. It says, God, who began a good work in you, will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And so, the grace of God, which brings us into a right relationship with, with the Lord Jesus Christ, with God himself, works in us to uh, help us to see how wonderful God is and how uh, how much our, the heart that God's put in us desires to please God above everything else because we see how much more valuable he is than everything else in our life. Now I'm reminded of a song from the musical Godspell, which uh, now is uh, almost 50 years old. It came out in the early 70s. There's a song that's called Day by Day. The uh, words from this song Day by Day were originally adapted from a prayer uh, from a 13th century English bishop known, uh, known by St. Richard of Chichester. Now, the words of the musical go like this. Day by day, day by day, O oh dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. It is the grace of God which causes our hearts to renounce ungodliness, the things that aren't pleasing to God. That's because the gift that God gives us is for us to see how much greater knowing and being and loving and enjoying him is than any of the other gifts that we have in life. Now, in light of this, ask yourself, what do I want? What do I want? Here's the third question for us this morning. What do I do? What do I do? Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 to help us to answer this question. It says that we are waiting, those of us who are in Christ, are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So God has changed our hearts, and he's done a work in us that we couldn't do in ourselves. And the heart that he's given uh, to those of us who believe in Jesus with saving faith is to want to be with him in all of his reality. And yet we know that we cannot be with God in all of his reality in the fullness of that until Christ returns and sets up his new kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth, and he uh, does away with this world. 
At that point, we will be with the Lord forever, the Apostle Paul tells us. So that means that we will need to continue to wait until the time that Jesus returns to set up his eternal kingdom. Until that time, we have some work to do in his name. The work we do is not ultimately our own work because, as Titus 2 says, we belong to him. We belong to God. We are his possession. And our passion, as those who belong to him, is that Jesus be glorified. Now, it says in Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Corinthians 10 31 says this, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And so when you see the Lord for how awesome and how amazing is, he is, you want to love him and you want to be with him and you want to do everything in your life for his honor and glory. The Lord designed us to worship. If we don't worship God, the creator, we will worship God's creation. We'll worship ourselves, we'll worship other people, we'll worship the earth. Whatever it is outside of God, we will worship if we're not worshiping him. But God alone is worthy of all praise. He is the one who made everything that we can see and everything we can't see. Our worship of God causes us to be and to, to do everything so that he would be fully seen as God Almighty and glorified for who he is. And so a true believer in Christ does good works, but they flow out of a very different place than someone who is not a true believer, who hasn't experienced saving faith. When the Apostle Paul says in Titus that God is purifying for himself a people that are zealous for good works, we need to know that these good works are not the works are not attempting to earn a spot, are not attempting to please uh, God so that, that a relationship with him will be started or will be maintained. They are, in fact, a, uh, they flow out of a relationship which has been started and continues by faith. The zeal that comes uh, from this relationship with God is a result of the reality of God's law of love, which has been implanted in the hearts of his people. What are these good works that we are zealous, to be zealous to do? The work of God is to believe him, to trust him, to follow him, to love him, to obey him. John 6, 29 records the words of Jesus. He said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. God's righteous people, those who have been by faith given the righteousness of God, they live by faith. It's not that just we've received God's righteousness as something that is our ticket to heaven, but the God of heaven and earth has implanted himself in us so that we are transformed and our life that was once uh, focused and centered on ourselves, focused and centered on others, focused and centered on the creation, is now centered on God. We live by faith in God. And whatever we do, whatever we speak, this is, the, this is the trajectory, this is the destination of everyone who follows and trusts in Christ. That all of our life would be for his glory. All of our life would be lived by faith. So whatever the Lord leads you to do, do it with the loving trust that he is with you. Whatever you do, do it with the joy that comes from knowing Jesus and being able to share with him every moment, both in this life and in the life to come. And so in light of this, the question remains, what do I do? What do I do? Live for God's glory. Now, having thought about these three questions, what do I believe, what do I want, and what do I do? Let me ask you a final one. Are you in the right place for this great spiritual advance which the Lord is bringing about in this time? If these questions reveal that you need to take a step in a different direction than the one you're headed, then I want to encourage you, do not wait to make that move. Make that move today. Make that move right now. Take a step of faith in the right direction. Don't be like the rich young man 
If you need to give up some things so that you can gain Christ, then what are you waiting for? Whatever you can have compares to compared to Jesus Christ is rags, is worthless. If you need, if something is in the way between you and your relationship with the Lord, then this is the moment now where you need to respond. And you need to ask yourself, what do I want? Do I want the Lord more than I want that thing that is in the way? Now is the time because the Lord has given us this time to take a tremendous leap forward, spiritually speaking. The life that sees Jesus more and more clearly, loves him more and more dearly, and follows him more and more nearly, moment by moment, day by day, is the life that Jesus has designed for us to have. And I believe that God in this moment, at this time, has given us a tremendous gift. And the tremendous gift that he's given is to take everything else away and for us to realize how little we need compared to walking and knowing and enjoying and being with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is truly the thing that we were designed to be with. He is the one that we have been designed to love and to be with and to enjoy forever. And so I want to encourage you, open your spiritual eyes. Realize the gift that God has given you. Understand that now is the time. A true revival, I believe, that could even eclipse the great awakening of our history here in America. I believe that it's possible for us if we embrace what God is giving to us in this moment. And for our sake, I want to pray through Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 through 14 in closing this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you that you've given us your grace. It has appeared and it is by faith that we receive the gift of salvation that you have for everyone who trusts in Christ Jesus. Lord God, I thank you that this grace has been poured out and the gospel message has been shared with us. And I pray, Father, that you would take away the blinders from our eyes so that we can see how beautiful you are and how wonderful you are and how awesome this gift of salvation is. And Lord, for those who are listening who haven't trusted you with saving faith today, I pray that you would take the blinders off their eyes right now and that you would open their hearts to receive you by faith. Father, as you have given us your grace to come into this relationship, to come out of the darkness and into the light, I thank you that you're giving us the grace to renounce all ungodliness and worldly passions. You're giving us your grace to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Father, I thank you, and I pray that you would continue to pour out this grace. Father, uh, our hearts can be so hard. We can be so resistant. Father, we can hold on to so many things. But I pray that you would just pour out your grace and you would clarify in our hearts and in our minds how wonderful you are, Lord, and allow us to take a step of faith that would put you in the right place as Lord of all, Lord of everything else. Lord, that uh, we would enjoy you and being with you above anything else, any other gift that you've given to us, God. Thank you, Lord that you will return one day. And we wait for this blessed hope when you will appear and you will redeem us, God, and you will bring us into a state of perfection that is only, Lord, known by you. And we wait, Father, for that glorious day. Lord, I pray until you come that you would put within us a zealousness to do good works, a zealousness to love you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and our strength. Lord, I pray that you'd put in a zeal to love our neighbor as ourself. I pray that, Father, that you would put in us a zeal for the gospel, Lord, which you showed, you demonstrated your love by coming to earth and dying for us, Lord, and giving us the good news. Father, I pray that that same love that you have for us, that you demonstrated 
by your work on the cross and by your message of salvation that you shared with us, Father, that that kind of love would be deposited in us and that there would be a zeal for the gospel that would go forth from our hearts, from our lives, Lord, to everyone that is in um, our lives, Father, and even beyond. And Father, I even pray now that you would uh, create a zeal in us for the gospel message to go forth from here to the ends of the earth, Lord, and that you would stir up within us the priority of the gospel message, the priority of your plan of redemption, Father, that we would be people that live by faith. And Father, that we would live by faith moment by moment, day by day. And I thank you for this, Lord, and I praise you and I glorify you. Lord, you alone are worthy of praise. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This afternoon, uh, I will be doing a sermon talk back at 3 o'clock again, and I want to invite you uh, to be a part of that. This afternoon also, for our children, we have the uh, Kids Connection, and uh, that class is also going to be on Zoom. If you're interested in being a part of uh, the Kids Connection uh, at 2 o'clock, or the sermon talk back. That information can be found on our website, the Connecting Church, the Connecting Church. I got this wrong last week. The Connecting Church slash Worship Online, and so you can go ahead and check that out. A few more announcements here before I leave you today. The Lady Sip Sit and Sip <clears throat> is uh, going to be meeting again. They met this past Tuesday, and if you weren't a part of it, but you would like to be a part of it. You can uh, contact Angie Mullen for information on how to get into that Zoom video chat. Uh, and uh, I heard it's a lot of fun, so ladies, I encourage you to take advantage of that. Nine o'clock on Tuesday morning. We're going to be starting a men's Bible study in the evening this Monday night, and it'll start at 8.30. We're going to look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels. And so if you're interested in men and being a part of a Bible study, 8.30 on Monday night, let me know and I'll give you the information on how to get connected into our video chat uh, for that. But I'm very excited. We've been praying about starting another men's Bible study uh, for a while and felt that this was the time uh, for it to go forward. So men's Bible study if, you're, if you need information about uh, how to get uh, contact with Angie Mullen or myself, I want to encourage you to, to, to uh, get in touch with Janet in the church office. We send out a Friday update email every Friday, and uh, that's our, our extended church network. And if you're not on that, then um, you need to, to, to call in and uh, have, have Janet put you on that because all of that information, those details are going to be on there. Um, uh, so uh, you can have that literally at your fingertips. So I encourage you uh, to call into the, uh, or contact Janet in the church office this week. Finally, I have an announcement about our Seventh-day Baptist brothers and sisters in the country of Uganda and in parts of East, other parts of East Africa. As you know, the uh, coronavirus has hit uh, the entire world but in East Africa, they are facing a double whammy. They have been hit with swarms of locusts and their food supply has dwindled. In addition to that, uh, our Seventh-day Baptist brothers and sisters in Uganda are uh, facing some um, added difficulties. You might remember Pastor Daniel, who came and visited our church this last year and spoke and told us about the ministry there specifically an orphanage that uh, one of the churches runs, over 80 children in that orphanage. And remember he talked about how every family and all of their churches there have taken in orphans because it's such a huge, huge need there in Uganda. Well, a couple of days ago, uh, Pastor Daniel let us know that all of the food for their orphanage was stolen and they have absolutely no money to go buy any more food. They are in desperate need. And so if you have the uh, ability to be able to send some extra money, we've already sent uh, some money to our missionary society, and uh, they have uh, the means to transfer money uh, immediately to Uganda. 
and they've already done that today, um, but uh, we are going to uh, be collecting some more money. So if you would like to be able to help our brothers, Seventh-day Baptist brothers and sisters in Uganda and in other countries in East Africa, I want to encourage you to uh, go to our website, The Connecting Dot Church, and go to the giving page on there. You'll find information how you can give online right now, or you can give a donation uh, to the church office and send that in. Um, they are really in dire straits right now. And it reminded me of a time in the book of Acts when there was a famine over the entire world and the, the, the um, believers in the church at Antioch, knowing that their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem were in need, they w God put it on their hearts that they needed to give. Um, and they were under a famine themselves. They were under difficulty. But the Lord put it on their heart to uh, provide a collection uh, for the needs of the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Um, our brothers and sisters in Uganda and East Africa are in need. And I want to encourage you to give as the Lord leads you to give. And so with that, I want to uh, um, bless you with uh, the blessing of the Lord. He is the one who is worthy of our praise. He is more precious than anything that we own, anything that we could ever have, any opportunity we could have. I want to encourage you to press in to him and to uh, draw close to him. If you do that, I know that he will draw close to you just like the book of James says. And so uh, may his blessing, the blessing of his presence rest on you. He loves you. I love you too. Have a great rest of your Sabbath day. Thank you.